announcing the winner of the iPad for the raffle draw. So don't let it pass. It's a good opportunity. If you're still here with us all the way till the end of this uh, conference, you have a chance to win that iPad ninth generation. Uh, exhibits, make sure you have visited the exhibits and also taken a few pictures, which you can share on the tweets as well as on LinkedIn using the hashtag. We are really looking forward because that's the place where we track and uh, check the progress that we've made today with your pictures. All right. Uh, coming up, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all uh, back after a nice nourishing lunch. And uh, let's make a memorable afternoon out of a full session of learning, inquiry, and networking. Uh, let's begin this session with the topic, how does hyperscale disrupt the traditional design, build, and operation of data centers? That's the question that we'll be putting forward to our panel today. And uh, moderating this will be uh, Mr. Greg Jasmine. He's CPC founder, managing director, X2X Group, DMCC. Please welcome to the stage our moderator. Nice round of applause, please, everybody. Get those sensors going and uh, get yourselves uh, into a nice new session here with Greg. Uh, Greg will be joined on stage uh, by uh, four of our panel guests. Uh, we have first up uh, Mr. Ronald Phillip. He is a senior director, Agility Data Center Campuses. Please give a nice round of applause to Ronald. Ronald is uh, joined on stage by Mr. Mahesh Trivedi. He's data center advisor, DC consultant. Please a clap for Mahesh. Uh, next on stage is Mr. Tomi Anianwu. He's a director, design delivery, Equinex. E-M-E-A. Please, a nice round of applause for Tomi. And finally, joining the panel is uh, Scott McCary. He is head of procurement, Pure Data Centers Group. Please, a nice round of applause for Scott. Over to you, Greg. Uh, please make sure your mics are working, gentlemen, and uh, good to go. Uh, we'd like some more people to join us. Please, if you've got friends and colleagues on the outside, make sure they join us in here. Uh, important topic of discussion, hyperscale disrupting the traditional design, build, and operation of data centers. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Well, hopefully we can make this very interactive and lively for this afternoon, right? I know it's after lunch but we want to get as much participation as possible from the panel and as well as from you. As uh, our moderator mentioned, my name is Greg Jasmine. I'm the founder and managing director of X2X Group, a data center consultancy here in the region. And we're going to let the panelists introduce themselves, but just to set the stage of what we're going to be talking about. All throughout this today we've been hearing about hyperscale data centers, hyperscale data centers. Everyone that you talk to in this region wants to build, design, operate for a hyperscaler. What does that mean? How is that impacting what we are doing here in this region? And that's what we're going to discuss and see, does it matter? What about the legacy data centers? How is this impacting the existing legacy data centers that exist in the market. So hopefully this will be an a interactive session. Let's start by introducing our panelists. If you can just introduce yourself and your role at your uh, company and your expertise, please. Sure, hi, my name is Ronald Phillip. I work with a company called Agility. Agility is the largest developer of industrial and logistics real estate in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, we have a land bank of around 10 million square meters of land with power and connectivity. Um, we build warehouses, but uh, we are uh, engaged with hyperscalers and data center operators to help them with data center sites, uh, either on within our own land bank, or we get them sites and build uh, powered shells for them uh, in multiple countries in the Middle East and across Africa. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mahesh Trivedi. I run my own consultancy firm of data center uh, design, build, operate. I've had about 25 years of experience delivering uh, data center space and, uh, and capacities to hyperscalers, retailers, enterprises over a period of 25 years, totally probably something around uh, 500 plus megawatts. Uh, so yeah, it has been an exciting journey and happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, Tommy Anyanwu. 
And actually, the gentleman did a great job pronouncing my uh, surname earlier, which is not easy, <laughs> so well done. Um, I work for Equinix as um, the Design Delivery Director for the Middle East, Africa, and Turkey. Um, been in the industry close to 20 years. Um, a large part of that um, has been in data centers. So I'm very pleased to be here um, to discuss with my fellow panelists. A very exciting topic, which I think um, the industry, you know, it's, it's um, definitely one of the... Uh, the, the fastest growing sectors, um, you know, today. So looking forward to a very healthy discussion on both sides. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Scott McCary, um, Head of Procurement at Pure Data Centers. Uh, we <coughs> typically design, build and operate data centers. Uh, we've got a few projects in development in the region. Uh, we've got a few in Europe, Middle East, uh, Far East as well. Um, I've been working in the sector uh, something like 12 years now, uh, probably half of that in the Middle East itself. Excellent. Well, maybe let's level set because uh, everyone speaks of hyperscale or hyperscalers. What is a hyperscale data center? Who wants to take that? Just so we can level set before we begin our discussion proper. What is a hyperscale data center? Is it just about the size? Yeah, good question. And uh, sorry, I, I, will, I will just go ahead first uh, because probably you all are from the region and I come from India, so maybe it's a different perspective to what you have here. But in India, typically, yeah, it's the scale, to be very honest. It's the scale, when I say scale, it's the megawatt requirement, which defines what is hyperscaler for the business. And anything above a single requirement of 10 megawatts, typically, was what we used to classify as hyperscalers. And uh, that's where we are at India, at least. Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I think to, to expand on that, I think 10 megawatts is traditionally what we describe as, as a hyperscale data center, but I think in, over my years in the industry, hyperscale has become a term used to describe certain customers rather than a, a volume of megawatts. Um, yeah, we, we probably all know who those customers are, like there's only a handful of them, so I think that's an important part of what a hyperscale is. I definitely agree. I mean, yes, size in broad terms, and if you want to be generic, and I think hyperscale data centers and customers um, offer a lot more than that. Um, scale is a factor. Um, you know, it's the, the build to scale, you know, specifically because of the, uh, the offering they provide to cloud service providers and large enterprise, um, you know, the volume of data and content um, that these guys offer to the market. So, you know, it needs to be a scalable design um, you know, the day one capex investment in terms of the real estate and infrastructure um, certainly um, is a lot higher than, you know, your, your legacy traditional color data centers. So, yeah. That's a very good point, Tommy. You know, when I first came into the region 12 years ago, if we were building one megawatt site, master plan for two and a half, maybe three megawatts, wow. That was the big scale, right? What are we seeing now on the top end of like a master plan site? Is it 10 megawatts? Is it 20? Someone earlier mentioned 50 megawatts. What are we seeing in the region in terms of master planning on the top end of the scale? I think um, in the region, compared to the flat markets and um, the rest of Europe, I think, I think the Middle East is still catching up um, when it comes to the hyperscale um, environment. But certainly, like you say, um, Greg, um, your day one you know, capacity is certainly in multiples of 10. Um, the important thing as well is to ensure that the campus um, is master planned for scalability. Because you know, the, these guys will phase um, rapidly at scale. Um, and with all the advancements in um, you know, HPC and AI and the ecosystem is changing a lot with regards to hyperscale. So day one capacity could be anywhere, like we say, from 10 to 20. But the master plan has to be planned for, you know, multiples of that. I, I was just going to reiterate what, what Tommy said. I think multiples of 10 in the region is, is typically what we'd see, whereas in, in Europe, uh, you know, even bigger than that, 100 plus megawatts. But yeah, multiples of 10 in the region is where we're currently looking at. Excellent, excellent. Hopefully we'll, be, we'll get there soon in this region where we're talking about 50, 100 megawatts of capacities. But, but we're... We'll get there. Now let's talk a little bit about the, how does planning for a hyperscaler impact the core design, the infrastructure, maintenance and operation? What are we seeing in the region? Uh, how is that 
planning for the hyperscalers um, impacting those core, core items like infrastructure and design? So, Mahesh? Yeah, so sorry, uh, because I have the mic, I would just like to take that first. Just to add on to the last previous query, you know, uh, hyperscalers will be the ones who will drive this uh, demands for sure, if you want to go to the megawatt scale. Just to give a perspective, the last project I worked on is a 14 building totaling 500 megawatts of power. Four of them already ready for delivery almost. Uh, one single building is uh, 50 megawatts IT, 50, 50. Each floor plate is 10 megawatts IT. So that's the volume and scale we are looking at, I mean, doing right now in India. And I'm sure it's a matter of time before it hits this market. And uh, I mean, we better be prepared, and that's, I think, one of the reasons we are all talking about this here. We do know it's coming, but two things I would like to mention. It will come very fast, and as uh, Tommy right now mentioned, if they ask for you know, capacity in six months, they will take it in six weeks. They will be standing at your doorsteps for the next delivery. It's a lot faster than you can anticipate. Same, right, when we are in the service, providing that to our. So coming back to your, and this apparently links to your query that where it, it really matters, which is the design, build, operate, you know. So uh, at least what we have seen, and this, this is a, uh, with all the hyperscalers, uh, most of them prefer BTS, what we call build to suit, right? They have their own cookie cutter models, which they have replicated the world over and they would like to get a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we call that uh, uh, standardization of that demand, uh, uh, design and operation, so that, because their staff also comes from anywhere in the world to service or be positioned in that geography. So they want a standardization of design and operations to be followed what they do globally, right? So they do insist on build to suit, but of course, depending on the local conditions, regulations, availability of people, power, et cetera, et cetera, they are flexible into that sense, but typically they would insist on a lot of uh, build to suit, uh, where you have to be very flexible as a service provider to accommodate their request. Uh, that's on the design part. On the, on the delivery part, they are very, very aggressive. As I said, they will say, you, you need to deliver in six months, but they will stand at your doorsteps in three months. So that is some business strategy you need to have when talking to them, have a deeper understanding of their business plans in the region. And Align, you may have to take some forward calls on ordering lead time equipment. So that also affects your business model in a way. And of course, then comes the operations where, uh, uh, at least in India, maybe five years back, it came as a surprise or a challenge or a cultural change, I would say, in that sense, where the safety and HAC in general, you know, took uh, the top uh, priority. Correct. Of course, I'm not saying India was not safety aware, but the importance was lesser to be sure, I mean, uh, for sure then. But now it's the top priority for all these guys who are offering services to the hyperscalers. And it, thankfully now it's become a norm to offer some minimum safety standards, which is good, I thought. So yeah, they do affect, and of course, as we discuss along, we can you know, uh, highlight a lot of other operation challenges or uh, you know, um, uh, the, the, the demands they throw on the operations as well. So. You know, that brings up a good point. So everyone in the room knows the hyperscalers that we're talking about that uh, the service providers would tailor from. Is it one design that can meet any one of those requirements or do you need to, to tailor the design to each one of these hyperscalers? I think fundamentally, um, you can draw a lot of comparisons between the designs to form standard reference designs and blocks. Um, typically, on, on the MEP side, um, you, you really want your design to be scalable. You know, and that could mean various things. Um, electrical, for example, you could look at a, a block redundancy topology. And that allows you to return your, prim you know, your primary blocks and your R block from day one and just add in primary blocks as you scale up. You know, the good thing there is you don't disrupt customers because they're, they're, they, you know, the customers are, are being fed from primary blocks as existing and you add new blocks to that. You can also be flexible and look at a distributed topology because the advantage of a you know, hyperscale data center compared to a retail data center is because you know, you've got one customer or a couple of customers that you can manage, you can plan you know, those, um, you know, those phases, those future phases you know, with minimal disruption because you've got one or two customers as opposed to a, a legacy traditional data set, retail data center, when you've got multiple customers, 
and they've all got to be notified, they've all got to come make sure that you know, they're dual powered and the equipment interacts with dual powered and you don't drop a customer. So you can be quite flexible on the design side. Um, mechanical, you know, come, come back to your point, Greg. I think, I think you need to look at where you are um, in terms of you know, can you get you know, the right water supplies you know, for, for your cooling? Are you dry cooling, are you wet cooling? Is grey water available? Um, you know, there are various technologies out there. Um, sustainability is a big factor as well. Um, customers, hyperscale customers, you know, want to see that you know you're green as much as possible, and I think data center operators are doing a lot more now to actually show um, what they're doing in that space, as opposed to just putting you know uh, a nice you know flashy um, you know terminology on, on your on your sales marketing sheets. You know they want to know you know where you're buying your your, your equipment from, are the vendors, what are they doing, um, is, is it power, is it green power? Um, all that sort of thing, you know, so it's quite important, I think, in, in the space going forward for the hyperscale design side. No, I, th I think Tommy and Mahesh gave uh, really good overviews of what, what we would expect to see. Um, I think the, the traditional data centers that we've seen, which aren't hyperscale in, in the region, are, more, are designed more generically, and uh, Mahesh used the term build to suit for the hyperscalers, so uh, yeah, we'd expect to see at a hyperscale level we're, we're designing and building for a, a specific or very few specific customers, whereas traditionally it's been more general. Uh, so that impacts things like the physical security. Uh, uh, hyperscales are wanting their own requirements met at like a data hall or a single building level, whereas the traditional data centers we'd see in the region are more at a rack level or a, a role level of physical security. Very good. So if we're master planning a site 50 megawatts, we're starting at 10. So that means there's some future technologies that are coming down the pipeline, right? Uh, everyone's hearing about artificial intelligence, AI. How do we see, how do you plan for that? Can you plan for that? Can you future-proof either a data center or a master plan campus to be able to accommodate future loads or future workloads that will come down the pipeline from, from these clients. What are some thoughts around that, guys? Yeah, I think most companies would want to minimize their one capex, um, to fair as much capex as possible, right? So you've got your phase, and ju just with the phasing as well, it's quite important to understand you know, the customer's ramp profile, um, and there's a bit of education that goes into that as well. So a customer might want a certain capacity, are they gonna draw that capacity? Um, you know, are we going to sweat the assets? You know, um, so I think you can defer an infrastructure. You know, to minimize the day one capex is quite important, but then it's been linked back to the customer's ramp and draw profile. Um, in the region, we have the added complexity with, with permitting. Um, rest of Europe and other places, augmenting power to get higher densities in a, in a data center could mean just the lead time in equipment procurement, but over here. Um, you've got to add a design and permitting factor because, you know, as we know, the authorities, you know, operate a bit differently on how they view the distribution and infrastructure, you know, connected loads versus planned loads. You know, those are things you've got to factor in the design. Um, on the CSA side, you want to get in the shell and core as much as possible, get out of the ground, um, fit out your, your, you know, your day one holes and leave um, your shell and core fallow to speed up um, the next phases in the campus. Excellent, excellent. You just mentioned core and shell. And uh, in terms of different business models that we're seeing out there that is enabling uh, the hyperscalers to come into the region, Ronald, what are you guys seeing on your end in terms of a different business model that can enable these uh, hyperscalers to come into the region? Sure, so I mean, um, I think a lot of people when they think about the hyperscalers, they're familiar with the model where they lease from uh, operators, right? But globally, um, what's increasingly common is either they do a self-build or they work with logistics real estate developers who have a large land bank and permitting and land acquisition expertise. I'll give you an example. In London, the largest data center cluster is Slough Estate, which is owned by Seagrow, which is a logistics real estate developer like us. They have 29 powered shells leased to all manner of data center operators and hyperscalers. Uh, another operator like us uh, called Goodman, has three gigawatts of powered shells leased to hyperscalers and operators. So a model that we think uh, could work in the region which we're discussing with hyperscalers is either if they want to self-build, 
Um, we are able to provide them with sites, with power, and a large amount of land, and we are able to build the core and shell for them. In another instance where they want three sites in a country where they've never acquired land or got permitting, and where no other international operator has done that before, um, we're able to help them there because we've been in these countries for a very long time. We're able to get the land, get the permitting, put up the core and shell for their operators of choice. So this is um, what we are in talks with hyperscalers for, to help them get to market much faster because, I mean, to Mahesh's point, they, they want to go, go, go. And if they try and look for a piece of land, try and get permitting, try and get power from scratch, never having done that in the markets, without having the relationships at the municipality, at the utility, et cetera, it's going to take them much, much more time versus working with us. And are you seeing a lot of interest from either the hyperscales, or who are you seeing interest from for this type of business model? We're in conversations with four types of people. Uh, the hyperscalers directly, the second is the international operators who are looking to enter the region and already familiar with this business model because they lease uh, in Slough from Seagro. The third is the regional operators and the fourth are the telcos. So, I mean, a fair amount of different types of actors in the region, but the hyperscalers are looking to deploy in this region and you know, some of it is public, some of it is not. Very good, very good. Uh, in terms of uh, how does the hyperscale uh, data centers differ in terms of investment and business models. Mahesh, maybe you can talk about what you have seen in India. Maybe it's not here yet, but what are you seeing in terms of uh, uh, investment and business models uh, in, for hyperscalers in, in India? Yeah, so as I said, you know, uh, you have to take some forward calls when you are dealing with hyperscalers. Uh, they will come at, uh, at a very fast pace and it does take time uh, to build those capacities. I mean, 10 megawatts is, 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 is a big amount of power and distribution to, to handle and manage, you know, to set up in the first place. So sometimes when you are, you know, as I said, rightly engaged with the hyperscalers, you do get a feeling that they will come up with a requirement far earlier than what they had, you know, asked for. And that's where some of the business models have to be aligned that way. Although there is always a pushback from the finance guys that first show me the, the order or the LOI, then I will release the money, right? But that's where the always there is an internal debate and discussion and, a, and, a, and an argument that, yes, I guarantee you that the business is coming. And there are lead, lead and we are aware that there was this shortage of semiconductors and a lot of uh, things got delayed. And I mean, uh, so, so yeah, we have to factor all of those. So this is one part of it. The second part is that, you know, the skill sets they are looking at, you know, and the kind of uh, quality you are supposed to deliver is again a major cost factor, I would say. Uh, you have to factor that this is the minimum standards they expect, nothing less, you know. You can go up but not down, definitely. So that's where you should factor some of those. For example, if you are doing it this way, you should do it that way. I mean, give you a simple example if you are looking at the bus bus. Traditionally, in India, we used to use a lot of aluminum bus bars, but uh, we have had, uh, you know, clear uh, specified uh, uh, RFPs from the hyperscalers not to use aluminum bus bars, right? Uh, they may even insist maybe off the records during our discussions and pr prefer some of the leading brands where you may have to pay a premium, right? So these are the kind of differences uh, you should expect in your, in your finances when you are dealing with hyperscalers. Excellent. Now, someone earlier mentioned on an earlier panel mentioned costs. When I first moved here into the region, the cost of building a data center was about nineteen to twenty thousand dollars per kilowatt, and then the price got down to fifteen. These days, I'm not going to ask these guys and put them on the spot, but I've heard the target is sub ten thousand per kilowatt. Is that happening in the region? I don't know. Maybe that's something we need to look at. I think earlier Stephen mentioned, uh, Stephen Beard mentioned, you know, building uh, for sustainability, building even a higher cost data center, if it's sustainable, the clients are willing to pay for it. Are we seeing that in the region yet? Maybe, maybe not, but it's something to think about as you're designing 
and prepping for data centers and also for loads to come, um, taking into account sustainability. What are you guys seeing in terms of sustainability? Is that a nice to have? Is that a must have in the region at the moment? Yeah, so sorry. Uh, in India, it's a must to have because there are local regulations, there are corporate commitments, and there are end customer requirements. So there's, that makes it kind of compulsory, not negotiable at all. So sustainability is big uh, to the extent that now, you know, most of the data center players are targeting the scope three, what we call, because one and two are probably addressable within their own, own you know, logistic circles, but the third extends to the outsourced. So where now all the purchase orders and contracts signed with your outsourced vendors, make them also align with your goals, and that's where we also expect them to be sustainability uh, aligned and you know, focused. So that's the level of uh, uh, sustainability initiatives being driven in India right now. Very good, Scott. Yeah, I think it's um, it's 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 been driven by by the hyperscalers. <laughs> at the end of the day, um, I think we are we are seeing an industry wide move to more uh, sustainable practices, and we're certainly looking at um, things away from like the traditional PEV to what what's the the operational impact of this piece of equipment versus that piece of equipment. So uh, that's definitely happening uh, at an industry level. Uh, maybe a little bit behind in terms of a regional level, but it's uh, definitely a, a, a move in that direction over the last few years. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, you know, the hyperscalers are heavy consumers of power and water in some cases. Um, there's a responsibility there, um, back to the environment, back to the community, um, to be sustainable. Um, and there's a lot of good technologies out there. Um, I think some of those are not yet mature in the region, but it's certainly getting there very soon. Very good. Yeah, no, so um, we had an interesting situation where uh, a potential customer looked at one of the photos of one of our logistics parks. It's a million square meters, and we've built out 300,000 square meters of warehouses. They said, that's a lot of roof space. How much solar can you get on that? We said our early assessment is 35 megawatts. And they said, that's very interesting, because that's a key priority for us. So I think it's important for all of them. And um, I think one of the advantages that we have is that we can provide a significant amount of solar on day one just from all the roof space that we have. Yeah, dedicated solar. I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of clients are putting this directly into their RFPs and, and making sure that it's one of the key items in there in, the, in terms of scoring, not just pricing at the end of the day, but, but what are you doing from a sustainab sustainability perspective? Well, let's make this a little bit more interactive we don't want to lose the crowd. Let's see if we have any initial questions from the crowd um, um, before we go on with our you know, uh, additional questions. No, I thought there's going to be at least one or two questions, because I, I see some familiar faces. Thank you, yeah. Milan. I knew you had a question. <laughs> So the, the AI thing is quite interesting, isn't it? Because on the one hand, we're in the preparation phases. On the other hand, Eric Schwartz at Cyrus One is talking about 300 kilowatt racks. You've had a bunch of the operators, Digital Realty, NVIDIA Ready Data Center in Singapore, and the designs can be implemented elsewhere. Um, and I'd love to hear the Equinix perspective and maybe what the others are hearing or doing or seeing what their clients are doing with respect to actual preparation for these high density environments that will inevitably come, right? Maybe Middle East and, and Africa may be a little bit behind, for example, but you know, what, what's happening right now and what preparation is actually going on in practical terms you know, today? Preparation for AI loads that is to come. Yeah, I, th I think it's, you know, Milan, great question. And I think it's something that um, a lot of companies are, are still researching. Um, understanding best case users. And um, we've certainly got a few um, um, things going on internally which, which I can't go into too much detail. But um, we see those inquiries coming into the region now um, at a rapid pace. Um, you know, that technology is evolving um, to see its you know, high performance computing um, AI. It's a, it's a big part of our world these days. Um, liquid cooling space, you know, that's an interesting technology that's, uh, that's coming to the market. And um, you know the, the, the tying points to the infrastructure um, is very very important. 
So even day one designs at infrastructure level need to start considering um, this application in a hybrid environment. If you're, if you're designing for a hybrid data center with a plan to get your, your traditional retail co-location customers, but also provisioning space for high density data halls um, for the hyperscale customers, those are the sort of factors you've got to implement or provision in that infrastructure. So if they come and when they do come, um, that's an easy interface um, into, your, into your building infrastructure. Yeah, that's an interesting point. We recently looked at a client uh, that was providing for liquid cooling to a CDU outside of the data hall space, and with, which leaves it to the end user customer to do the final adjustment. Do they want to do rear door? Do they want to do immersion cooling? From the CDU, they, can, uh, they have the flexibility to go either way, and, and it allows them to be able to accommodate within the same space that would have been a traditional, let's say, colo, um, additional heat loads um, without necessarily having to add um, um, bigger infrastructure on the back end to cool 100 ki kilowatt per cabinet, et cetera. So, so a lot of provisions have been made um, to be able to accommodate these loads in the future, which is a good thing. Yeah, Mahesh, just add on to say? that because I just completed a project of six megawatts into two where we have a, a, a single hall has a mixture of the immersion cooling, the direct chip level cooling, and the traditional fabric cooling. Because that was for the switch gear, this was for something else, and that was for the high performance computing. Uh, just to talk on that AI, last week I was in Singapore and met a customer who's talking of a, a 40 kilowatt rack, and not one, of course, an entire hall of 40 kilowatt racks. And we tried to understand that we are making a mixed use building in, the, in that sense that some of it will be colo. So it's a design challenge for us. Can you please elaborate what is your you know, end purpose for this? And apparently, as I think Milan pointed out in his talk morning, it's, it's probably more to do with the learning aspect of the AI, which it's too early, but I think could be a batch process or a, I don't know. So what we were thinking and debating with the end customer was that can we have two halls for you? A learning hall where we'll design in a different way, and a regenerative hall where you actually you know, implement the AI findings, right? which could be maybe a 10, 15 kilowatt rack, which is more along you know, the colo lines what we see nowadays, or even hyperscalers. So that's what we are trying to understand. To be very honest, we are not there. We still don't know what AI will throw up as a challenge, except knowing that it will throw up a cooling and power challenge, which has been always a catch-up game for colo guys anyway, right? <laughs> so that's where we are on the AI. And just before you know, we lose track of that, you, you mentioned about the pricing. So without naming the figures, it's the reverse trend in India. We started with 10, for an example, we are yeah. almost at 20 now. The costs have gone up. Couple of reasons, yeah. Interesting. So, so couple so of reasons would be, we were doing it the dirty way, one thing. We were not doing as per probably the global standards, so we had to elevate ourselves to that extent, which definitely incurred extra costs. Uh, in general, right now at least, it could be a passing phase, but. Uh, there's huge demand. If I go to a DG guy, he says, sorry, 24 months is the lead time. Why? Because my entire factory is booked with XYZ, other data centers. So that could be another reason, but uh, the costs are going up for sure. That's very interesting. You know, it'd be interesting to uh, work out the impact on that to the selling costs That's come down. In, the, uh, <laughs> in the market as well. Any additional questions from the, uh, from the audience? There's a hand in the back there, please. So uh, I have two questions. One is on the designing phase. So while designing power backup, what is the consideration for UPS batteries? Is it VRLAs or is it the new lithium ion batteries? And whatever is the consideration, uh, why that is so? And my second question is, on the operations front, uh, is battery health monitoring 24 by 7 important or it's not? Ah, we have a battery guy in the room. Okay, let's see. Okay, so battery technology, VRLA versus lithium ion batteries. What are you seeing? What are you thinking about when it comes to batteries for, for UPS backups? 
I think what, what we're seeing is definitely VRLA. Um, we're not moving to lithium ion simply down to the fire risk. Um, and we're also doing a bit of research and development into new and alternative uh, battery technologies. I, I don't think that the market is there to support hyperscale data centers for that at this stage. But yeah, definitely uh, we are sticking with VRLA at this stage. I think just on the first question, which regards to design, I think the question is around the autonomy, um, if I heard you correctly. I think that, that depends on the customer. Um, in most cases, I think most hyperscale customers are happy with five minutes. Um, you know, your power is, you know, if you talk about a region, for example, power reliability is very high in this region. Um, places like Africa, you may look at longer autonomies on, the, on those batteries. But typically five minutes to 6.5 minutes, um, you know, um, end of life is, is what we typically see on average with customers. And then for battery monitoring, uh, uh, you're seeing that as a need for battery monitoring, 24 by 7 monitoring for, um, for the batteries? Battery monitoring is key. Um, linking back to operations, the hyperscale um, operations environment is, is quite different um, from your sort of colo traditional legacy data centers as well. Um, it, it's, it's leaner and a lot more efficient. A lot of, um, you know, there, there, is, there is predictive maintenance, if you like. Um, you know, BMS and controls and monitoring is, is quite high and needs to be. Um, you know, the, the data center needs to run itself with limited um, resources on the upside to keep the OPEX down. You know, you've got a single large customer or a couple of customers, so you want the, you want the systems to be smart and intelligent. So monitoring plays a key part on that as well um, versus, you know, your retail data center, which is catching up, um, you know, with, with those systems, but a lot more resources on the human side. Very good. And I think we have another question on this side. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and very insightful topic, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose it's more of a question related to, or maybe I need to rephrase the question that is shown in the board, yeah. So rather than saying disrupt, yeah, how can hyperscale improve yeah, the traditional design, build, and operation, yeah, from, uh, from, from us professionals who are working in the, in the sector, we are seeing other sectors deliver uh, projects in a shorter time frame. Yeah? You know, time is money. Yeah? And we talk about profitability, your know, cost you know, in delivering it. But from our end as professional, how can we future-proof ourselves in making sure that we have the right knowledge you know, coming from experts like you? Yeah? Sure, sure. Okay, so good question. Uh, let me just very quickly run you through the process, what it takes to set up a data center, right? Very quickly, and then I'll ask my colleagues to add in. The land acquisition itself is a long process, right? And uh, it becomes more complicated when it's a hyperscale because apparently, you know, their requirements are more, they have to be future-proof, you have to build in spare capacity, you know, growth potential, so you look at a bigger land parcel. The bigger the land parcel, more money, more processes, more permissions to be taken, right? It starts from there. Secondary, it goes to, uh, you know, uh, the setting up, the actual setting up of the core and shell, of the lead long items, instead of a small, uh, Colo, where you need five, data, five generators, you will need 50 now. So this all adds to the complexity of the delivery timelines, right? And then to actually execute all those cables, all those bus stacks and the things which go into that big hyperscalers. So there is a finite time needed to, to deliver that, that scale and model. So that's where the time, we have to be a little more careful if you are planning to address their concerns or their demands. That's why we call it disruptive, right? It, it kind of it's not the traditional way of doing things. It goes beyond. Maybe so, he can answer it. So, so even if we take up, you know, let's bring it up one level, right? Uh, if I understand your question, it's also about the person, right? How do you skill yourself in this market to be able to uh, be of value as the market is changing from your traditional colo to hyperscales? You know, we're all professionals here at the, you know, on the stage. How have you skilled yourself up Right to be able to uh, uh, handle uh, these new loads, these new types of clients coming into the market. Is there anything? Are there podcasts you're listening to, or or you're doing a lot of reading? What are you doing personally to kind of upskill yourself um, for for the upcoming you know clients in the in the region? If I understood your question correctly. Well, I, th I think. Um, but <laughs> Personally, uh, I've, I've spent a few years working in the sector in Europe, so you're bringing a bit of the, the experience there. And I think at an industry level within the region, um, there's probably not as much hyperscale data center experience within the, the workforce. 
uh, as it would be in other markets. So I think now that we're seeing more and more of that, that's going to come naturally as well. Um, and what the hyperscalers bring is hundreds and hundreds of data center projects worth of experience to the region when they come here as well. Uh, best practice, uh, sustainability, all these kind of things. Yeah, I think the gentleman mentioned time as well. Time saves money. I think that's the exact word he used. I think it's very important to have good, repeatable, and scalable designs. Um, one of the big problems in, in the traditional color space is bespoke um, designs that are different, different blocks, different ratings of equipment, which is not great as well for the procurement sector. Um, we see that the, the, we have the longest lead times we've ever had in, in the industry. Inflation is very high. Um, you know, everyone is pre-stocking or pre-buying. So you want to you want to ensure that your designs are repeatable, but at the same time pulling in all the lessons learned um, from all the projects out there, speaking to customers, understanding what's important for them in the design, and where their failure points have been with other providers goes a long way as well to ensure your design is fully robust and addresses those concerns. Maybe a final question for. Please, go ahead, Ron. So I, I think uh, there's been a lot of learning from interacting with the hyperscalers. But in some cases, it's been interesting because they've come to us with their designs. And we've been part of the journey where we engage with the municipality and say, will this design work? Or will this design work? And that they've had to sometimes tweak things to the region uh, with our help and bring, being that bridge with the municipality to, to see what design would work in this region, which would be acceptable by the building code, et cetera. So it's, it's been a lot of learning by interacting with them. But they're also learning in the region, too. Maybe a final question for the panel. You know, um, there's a lot of legacy data centers that exist within the region. Now, with all these hyperscale data centers coming, what do we see as the impact? What is the evolving road of, uh, role of these maybe existing legacy data centers into the ecosystem. Any thoughts on that? I think it's, it still creates an amazing opportunity for legacy data centers. And the hyperscale will have a sector and will certainly have its customer mix. And we know who those are, okay? The cloud service guys and large enterprise. But a, a lot of companies still adopt um, you know, a, a hybrid cloud approach, which is a mix of clouds. And they will still need their own space in, um, in color, you know, color data centers. Um, and the hyperscalers would then need to provide access points into those rich ecosystems um, you know, to serve those customers in there, right? So I, I think the opportunity is great. Um, I think it creates a niche and it creates you know, a focused sector for the color legacy space you know, to target certain customers and the hyperscale customers you know, have, again, their focused environment you know, with the, the large hyperscale operators and companies offer. So I think, yeah, it creates opportunity to scale up on both sides, um, vertical and horizontal, you know, in, in the color space. And um, uh, well, a key point, though, is the densities have gone up. So in the past, um, we all saw the three to five kilo per cap. That is, you know, excess of eight plus now. Um, and the key for the color space as well is to ensure that, you know, those assets are sweated. You know, you, you, the ops and capacity team is one to monitor very closely what load is actually drawn and utilized versus what's contracted. Um, that's quite key, because you can optimize you know, your sellable capacity um, onto such a point when you need to augment the next phase or the next power block to come in and support you know, the actual densities being drawn um, on that site. Yeah, well, I think uh, if, if your legacy data centers are 10 years plus, just forget them, I would say, sorry. <laughs> because uh, they would serve no purpose, and the fit-outs and refurbishing will be more expensive then the revenue. Believe me, the ROI will be too long. So edge, better leave it edge. to that. If it is five years max, you repurpose it for an edge application where the densities are less. Uh, I'm sure with legacy you will have challenges of accommodating more uh, diesel generators or transformers outside. So it doesn't make sense to be honest. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I want to thank, thank the panel for their insights. <laughs> you know, 12 years ago when I moved here, there's only maybe a couple faces that I recognized that were here at the time. Now I look around the room, I see all these faces, and a lot of it is because these hyperscalers have been coming to the region and has brought with it a lot of expertise that we see in the room. So let's make sure we interact and get to know one another as we're servicing these clients that are coming into the region. There's a reason they're coming here, and it's because of all of you. And so it's uh, very nice to see all of you here today, and please, uh, we'll, we can interact with the, uh, with the panel after during the break as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Greg. Panel, step forward for a group picture, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank on stage uh, Ronald, Mr. Mahesh, Tommy, Scott, and Greg for their fantastic uh, post-lunch conference right now. Their panel has been amazing. They've kept the energy going today. So let's give them all a nice round of applause, please.